Freebrum is um, interested in holonomic brain theory, and he's a professor of psycho neuropsychology at Stanford, and he's written a number of books, and his speech tonight will be about uh, brain theory. And um, I think he'll tell you everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing a book, and uh, uh, this is an, an endeavor to try to tell you some of the highlights of the book in uh, half an hour, an hour, <coughs> which is, of course, almost impossible, but uh, also you're spared the drudgery of all of the things that go into a book uh, that you can skip over if you've got the book, but you know, if somebody starts telling you about it, you'd have to listen, so uh, it's just as well. Uh, the book is called the Holonomic, well, it was called the Holonomic Brain Theory, but I finally decided to call it uh, Brain Organization and Perception. Uh, and the subtitle is Holonomy and Structure in uh, Figural Perception. And the reason uh, uh, for uh, modifying the title is that as I gave talks over the last six months or a year, I found that um, something was missing. And it was very interesting. Somebody um, on the way in here, uh, I can't spot right now, but uh, said, you know, it, it's, uh, I was saying that we're going to have a, a meeting at Esalen on holonomy and social structure. And uh, he said, well, is hologram, or holograms, you know, everywhere, is that it? There's nothing, uh, everything's a hologram. I said, no, heavens no. Uh, and uh, of course, that uh, was what was wrong with the title because there's so much else uh, that goes into brain physiology, brain function, and behavior that uh, one um, that I didn't want it to be completely holonomic. But uh, nobody is that interested in all the rest of the stuff. You know, uh, uh, the hologram uh, is really the the big breakthrough that was made and of the early 60s uh, into a, a sort of a window on another way of looking at things. And um, at not only looking at things, but when you look through the window, you see an order in the universe that's different from our ordinary experience. That doesn't mean we don't experience the other When we're listening to music, we sort of get the feel that if something is wrong, you know, that beat isn't quite right, and so on and so forth. So obviously we already are aware of what's going to come, and uh, 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 all of that fits into this uh, order in the universe where uh, time and space become folded. So uh, that is the new thing, and that's what I will be talking about tonight. But it's now 1988, not 1964, when I first uh, talked about these things. And uh, things have happened since then. Uh, not really happened, but they've happened to me. Uh, I've read and I've discovered things that uh, uh, other people knew, but I didn't. And so tonight I'm, I'm going to talk a little more historically about uh, the developments and where the book has gone and where the whole set of ideas has gone, because it has gone uh, a little further than what we had in the 60s and 70s. In my own work in the bra on brain, I also have taken this viewpoint that both the spectral domain, so-called holographic domain, because that's what a hologram is, is uh, these spots here uh, that have different values, and so the silver grains are just a bunch of spots that uh, uh, on a holographic film, uh, that this spectral domain is in fact a real phenomenon. It is not just a way of looking at the world. Uh, it is a, an, it has an existence, and that of course can be challenged. And uh, most 
I mean, if, uh, one place that uh, many people uh, in science and I don't agree, this is one of the uh, major issues where uh, we disagree. Everybody will admit that you can look at psychophysical and physiological and physical phenomena either through the spectral way or through space-time, and that they're related by the Fourier transform, but they won't agree that the spectral domain is necessarily there. It's just a way of looking at it, and what is there is just, you know, it's just there. And we have ways of looking at what is there. Now, uh, with that then, uh, we were able to either have these receptive field center, excitatory receptive field centers merge, or they would be spread very far apart. Now, when the receptive field centers merge, they act as the whole thing acts sort of all together. When they're very highly separated, they act more separated, more individual-like. And there are two different formulations, then, of this that you can have. One is much more space-timey, which is things are separated in space and time, or they all sort of converge and sort of beat together, and that's much more spectral. And there are two classes of theory that, uh, that this is called matrix theory when they're sort of spread apart, uh, and they're called uh, convolutional theory when they're more like the spectrum. And because you convolve one waveform with another, that's sort of multiplying, adding, multiplying together. Uh, so that, now, uh, since the early, well, in the last 10 years, anyway, um, a lot of evidence has come in from different quarters, people who don't have to put it together the way I am putting it together here for you tonight, uh, that, uh, the parts of the brain that we think make for this kind of organization, because when we stimulate, we stimulate the frontal lobes and we get this, are also the ones that interfere with the kind of problem, serial position, in memory, things of that sort, which are best handled by convolutional theory. And the things that go on back here, like categorizing, are best handled by matrix theory, which is more space-timey, if you will. So if you don't agree that this can be pushed all the way to the limit, necessarily, although I think that happens occasionally, or all the way to the limit out here, where that happens more often, and we get very space-timey and, you know, and don't appreciate any of the nuances that go on around us and just cut everything up. Uh, as very often do uh, in, in logic and in science, uh, then uh, you, you can push these things practically to the limit. But ordinarily, we live in, in the Hilbert space like uh, order, and sometimes we go more toward this and sometimes more toward that, depending on our own internal uh, operations, our memory traces, whatever. Uh, is jogging us at the moment, uh, or the environment, uh, when somebody hypnotizes us, or uh, we go into trance, or meditate, uh, uh, and uh, we use our frontal lobes more during those periods, or we, have, we are more open to the external input than we go more to our space time. So there are lots of different reasons why uh, the thing gets pushed in one direction or another. Now, uh, in vision, that is not, when you look at the diagrams up till a year or two ago, uh, almost all of them, with very few exceptions, simply talk about uh, uh, light out there being focused on a retina and coming out as an image. They show an object out here. They don't show the scatter of the light. The scatter is, is a, you know, I'm putting it in quotes. The, the distribution of that. By the way, the Fourier transform is one of many such transforms which are very often called spread functions because everything gets spread. And all I'm saying is that light bounces off objects and is all over the place and then lenses 
such as those that we have in our eyes, form a real space-time image. That's really what I'm talking about. Now, if that is the case, then how do we get this Gabor transform up in the brain? Well, the way we get it is by several con stages of convolution and so on, so forth, all of which I've documented in the brain. Now, the next question, of course, is so what? Why would the brain want to do it that way? Why would anybody want to build an instrument uh, for you to get around in space-time uh, uh, that stores things in a spectral domain or even processes it in a spectral domain? Well, the answer is that in that domain, you can do correlations very, very rapidly and easily. Those of you that have done statistics know what a fast Fourier transform is, which we do on computers, and you just crack it in there and correlations come up. Those of you who work in hospitals know what a, a CAT scan is uh, or a, 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 a magnetic resonance imaging. All of the image processing devices are done in this way. You take, a, put a beam through the skull and it comes out with certain numbers and another one and another one in different directions. You just add them all together, come, well, you first convert them into the spectral domain, into the Fourier domain, and then add them all together, convolve them essentially, or multiply whatever. It's a sort of a funny mixture between the two. And then do the inverse transform. You've got a beautiful three-dimensional image. So that's why. So for perception, this is an ideal way uh, uh, to process uh, uh, things. But you've got to go doing the transform, the inverse transform, the transform, the inverse transform. And the inverse transform is done through movement. As you move around, you do the inverse transform. And, uh, that's how you get object perception going. And maybe if I have a question about it, I'll give a demonstration of how that works. But I want to get on now to uh, just accepting that much of the philosophy that in fact, this spectral domain is a very real domain, and that we uh, uh, are dealing uh, with something uh, that is very useful also. Uh, and that is what I just said a moment ago. You take out a little piece of brain, and some mental faculties go away. You take out other pieces of brain, other faculties go away. There's some kind of relationship between the organization of brain and the organization, brain and body and senses and all, and the organization of our mental processes. Now, if that is the case, then we, we have to look at another theory which says that really the way our mental processes are organized is the way the brain is organized. This is called identity theory. And identity theory simply says, uh, these two things are really the same thing, and the way it has emerged in the 20th century, essentially, identity theory says that uh, mind and brain are the same thing, we just talk about them differently. We have mind talk and brain talk. Well, uh, I turned that around uh, around 1970 or thereabouts and said, okay, uh, that is certainly one way of looking at it, but you still have a problem then, and that is mind talk and brain talk about what? <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta have another language that tells you what it is that you're talking about with mind talk and brain talk, or, and this can go on uh, indefinitely. And so I suggested we turn the whole thing around and talk about in terms of these are two different uh, ways of talking about something, but that they are different ways that that something becomes real. In other words, we have a real brain and a real mind, as it were, and these are instantiations, these are realizations of a process. So you say, what is he talking about? Well, think of yourself. You really love uh, Beethoven, and you want to get a really good recording of Beethoven's ninth, and you want to hear it. Well, you just find out that choral is coming in and so on, and they're going to give a performance uh, at uh, Davies Hall. So that's one one way you can appreciate. Another one is you can get a tape. 
Other ways to get a, re a record. Still another is a disc, compact disc. There are all these various ways, or if you're a musician, you might, and if you're a conductor, you might even get the score, right? Now, all of those are realizations of something, aren't they? Of the, of the symphony. You rec if you know how to read music, if you know how to do these things, you can recognize all of this as the Beethoven symphony. What is the Beethoven symphony then? See, it's realized in all of these ways. Another example in a computer. I use a computer as a word processor. I talk English to my typewriter. It talks, scripts it, or some other word processing, word perfect, or whatever, word processing system down to the operating system and back to the assembler and then back uh, to make little switches go all over the computer. And then somehow it all comes back out again and prints it out in English. What is it that happens from English down to binary, which is the language that the computer talks, and back out to English? A set of transformations. But what is it that stays the same across all those transformations? Same thing as in Beethoven says. Something stays the same across all those realizations of something. And of course, that something, we have to put a name on it because we're human, so we call it information, the form within, or the structure of the music. I don't know. I don't really care what you call it. I call it informational structure just to give it a name. But you see that how similar this is now to, because you can't really touch it until it is realized, how similar this is to Plato's ideals. Bye. Bye. 